Alphonse Gabriel Capone, more commonly known as Al Capone, is the most infamous American gangster of all time. Born on the 17th of January 1899 in New York City to poor Italian immigrant parents, Capone ruled at the pinnacle of organized crime in Chicago over seven years of the Prohibition era. Capone began his criminal career at an early age, Right after being expelled from school at the age of 14 for striking a woman teacher in the face, the boy joined some small-time gangs, working as a bouncer and bodyguard, and later as a racketeer for the Italian outfit. He earned the nickname Scarface after being slashed by Frank Galluccio, a local New York toughie, after insulting his sister while working the door in a Coney Island dance hall one night. Capone moved to Chicago at the age of 20, joining his mentor and friend Johnny Torrio. Together, they established a crime syndicate known as the Chicago Outfit, controlling the gambling and prostitution scene. When the Prohibition Act was introduced in 1920, the pair became bootleggers and distributors of illegal alcohol. Al Capone was anointed head of the Chicago Outfit in 1925 by Johnny Torrio, who returned to Whitley after an attempt on his life by a rival gang. Left to independently control all the operations, the smart young Capone soon expanded his enterprises and adopted a luxurious lifestyle, which caught the attention of the authorities. He moved into a ritzy apartment in the Metropole Hotel, and then a suite in the Lexington Hotel, where he set up his headquarters. At the height of his criminal career, Al Capone was employing more than 600 gangsters throughout Chicago, with the local newspapers estimating that his business had earned him $100 million in revenue per year. Capone's net worth then is calculated to be about $1.3 billion today, and the clever crook always used cash transactions, thus eliminating any evidence or paper trails leading to him. He was finally arrested on the 5th of June 1931, when the US government resorted to charging him with income tax evasion. Ultimately, sentenced to 11 years of imprisonment, Capone was sent to the Atlanta U.S. Penitentiary in 1932, at the age of 33. There he was diagnosed with syphilis and gonorrhea, which combined with his cocaine addiction caused him ongoing illness, with side effects of disorientation and mental problems. It seems that his past had caught up with him in prison. With his personal legacy of causing the wastage of at least 30 lives, Sometimes for a little as being next to the wrong person, Capone is known to have either hallucinated or seen the ghost of one of his victims and be heard begging him to leave him alone. Capone was known to have been frequented by the ghost of James Jimmy Clark since an earlier prison stay at the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. Jimmy was one of seven of Bugsy Malone's men downed by Capone's gang who had dressed as police in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929. While Capone's one-bed cell at the penitentiary was extremely well furnished and even decorated due to his bribing of guards, Capone became convinced that it had a phantom roommate. He seemed constantly fearful and would shout out at night for Jimmy to go away. The other prisoners reported hearing him screaming throughout the wee hours and even holding conversations with someone. Even once Capone was released, Jimmy seemed to follow him and eventually the former crime boss commissioned a psychic to try to get Jimmy to leave him alone. The plan did not work and Al's fear of Jimmy only grew so that his bodyguards would often run into his room at night thinking he was being attacked only to find him alone and terrified. With the Capone's second and longest bout of incarceration he was eventually transferred to the notorious Alcatraz prison in San Francisco. There he resided for five years until his calm temperament persuaded the government that he was not a risk and that he could be transferred to another facility. With his health deteriorating due to his syphilitic dementia, he was sent to the Low Security Federal Correction Institution on Terminal Island near Los Angeles. There he spent his final year in hospital before his release on parole in 1939. The previously ruthless gangster spent the next few years in mental institutions he finally settled in Miami with his wife, where he stayed until his passing due to cardiac arrest on the 25th of January 1947. One year before that, Capone's psychiatrist had concluded that he now had the mentality of a 12-year-old child. 
the once cold-blooded crime boss left a substantial fortune behind except that no one knew what had happened to his wealth. Marie Capone, his niece, reported that her uncle had millions of dollars buried and hidden somewhere, but being too cognitively impaired when released from prison, he could not recall the location of his money. There would be rumours that he buried the cash on a peninsula in Michigan, and there are some who have been unsuccessfully seeking the loot ever since he was arrested. In the 1980s, a construction company called Sunbow decided to undertake a renovation of the Lexington Hotel in Chicago, Capone's final residence before his imprisonment. During their survey, Sunbow discovered a network of underground tunnels below the hotel which connected with the adjacent bars and brothels. They had been built to enable an escape route for Capone and his henchmen in case of a police raid. Within the tunnels, a shooting range was revealed, as well as a secret vault installed beneath the building, thought to contain some of Capone's wealth. The vault mystery was to be finally solved on the 21st of April 1986, when the safe would be open for a television show. The two-hour TV special entitled The Mystery of Al Capone's Vaults was broadcast on ABC and hosted by Geraldo Rivera. It was marketed as sensational TV viewing, as an audience of millions right across America witnessed the live excavation of the vault. Agents from the Internal Revenue Service were present in case money was uncovered, as well as a medical examiner if any human remains were evident. Come the final opening of the vault, the discovery only brought disappointment to the production team and viewers. The only findings were several empty bottles and dirt, with no other significant finds. Despite its disastrous ending, the show was still the most seen syndicated TV special, claiming an audience of over 30 million. The mystery of Capone's wealth remains unsolved, with many still searching for his elusive stash. Part of the mystery around America's biggest crime boss is the other side of the ruthless racketeer. Most people have not heard of the charitable support that Capone rendered during a harsh period for many of his compatriots. During the 1930s, the Great Depression caused a lot of citizen hunger, unemployment and homelessness. Although seen as a criminal by many, Capone was also a respected community leader amongst his peers due to his charity. It is thought by some that he did more to help the citizens of Chicago, Illinois than the state government itself. Al Capone's soup kitchen was situated on what is now a parking lot on the corner of 9th and State Street. It has been estimated as serving over 120,000 meals to hungry people. The free soup kitchen operated regular working hours serving up breakfast, lunch and dinner, feeding thousands every day on a skeleton staff. Besides providing hot meals for poor people, Capone was known for other kindnesses such as showing generosity towards needy strangers and Italian immigrants and even sending expensive flowers to rival gangsters' funerals. Some even saw the illegal wealth he made smuggling alcohol as an altruistic act, given the harsh restrictions of prohibition at the time. Despite being dubbed public enemy number one by the media, he was also seen as a modern-day Robin Hood in some circles. While he was notorious for his cruel way of treating his enemies, Capone was also a man of the people, always offering a handshake and a warm smile. However, it sounds like his cheery soul may still be serving some kind of penance, Rumour has it that you're able to hear the ghostly sound of Capone strumming his banjo at Alcatraz to this very day.